So thank you everyone for joining us today for this first uh, FireSafe Europe Digital Roundtable of 2021. Today we will focus on energy efficiency and fire safety amid the EU Green Deal. And in particular, we will look at uh, opportunities at different levels. So the EU level, the national level and the local level. I'm Jérôme Nandolfato, I'm the EU Public Affairs Officer for FireSafe Europe. So some of you might know FireSafe Europe already, but for those of you that don't really know us, we are the first European association um, working to improve fire safety in buildings with an active community of over 600 members. And our mission is to improve fire safety in buildings for people and society. So our host today is the MEP Kupula Natri. She's from Finland and from the SND group in the European Parliament. And she's a member of the Committee on Industry, Research and Energy. And she was one of the shadow rapporteurs for the own initiative report on maximizing the energy efficiency potential of the EU building stock. This report is important because it mentions fire safety in two of its paragraphs, and in particular, it stresses the importance of addressing fire safety throughout the whole building life cycle. With us today, we also have four experts presenting and sharing their knowledge with us. So we have Mr. Carlis Constein, Dr. Amaya Ozaka, Dr. Stephen Richardson, and Mrs. Irena Klisch Schellendich. So just a little housekeeping before we get started. All participants are muted throughout the webinar. If you want to tweet, please do so, and you can use the hashtag Building Fire Resilience. The QA box in the Zoom remote control uh, is for you the opportunity to share your questions with the panelists for us to address later on during the webinar. Please make sure to send them in the QA box and not in the chat. So it's easier for us to monitor and keep track during the QA session. Thanks in advance. If you're more comfortable having subtitle in the presentation, you can do so by activating um, live transcript. It's in one of the options on the Zoom control panel in the dot, dot, dot button there. And finally, we will record this webinar so all participants will receive the replay in the next days after uh, this live event. Uh, one last word before I give the floor to MEP Kumpula Natri. Uh, she has quite a busy schedule, so she might not be able to stay with us uh, today until the end. But if you have any questions for her, send them in the Q&A box and we will address them uh, to her office afterwards and make sure we have uh, follow up answers for you. So we'll do that through email or some other uh, media. So now I will leave the floor to MEP Kumpula Natri. So if you could unmute yourself and uh, turn your camera on so that the audience can see you and hear you, that would be perfect. Perfect. So now I leave the floor to you. Thank you for opening the event. Thank you. Thank you for the invitation and I'm very happy to have uh, over 100 participants at the moment. So it is very uh, timely uh, time for making such um, a, a seminar on the uh, concerning the building sector, concerning the houses. Not, not only that now we are more indoor than we used to be before COVID, and that also uh, increases the, uh, the importance of the, the proper housing, proper buildings that we do share the bigger part of our uh, time nowadays. So I want to warmly welcome you on this Fire Safe Europe's webinar on my behalf. The webinar on EU Green Deal Energy Efficiency and Fire Safe Renovations. Europe is facing a burning problem. How to cut the greenhouse gas emissions fast enough and simultaneously create sustainable and clean economic growth. The Green Deal proposed by the Commission is a strategic response to these acute issues that are actually matter for the whole globe. Buildings play a crucial role in the fight against the climate change that is of course the core of the Green Deal. Buildings are responsible for approximately 40% of the energy consumption and 36% of the CO2 emissions in the EU. 
I believe that the speeding up the renovations can be at the heart of the green recovery that is now financed also together. Renovation waves is a real win-win-win if we play the cars right. It can cut emissions uh, by improving the energy efficiency while renovating. It can create immediate local jobs that are needed so much, and it can improve a healthy and safe housing to give us uh, more comfortable and modern houses that are more also responding to the uh, uh, crisis on climate. So renovation wave can play a crucial role in improving the energy efficiency, and we shouldn't forget the opportunities it creates to improve the fire safety in the European building stock. Fire safety has a huge impact on the Euro citizens. Ensuring our approach to energy efficiency accounts for the fire safety, and it is vital to guarantee people's well-being and safety. Renovations are an opportunity to capitalize on investments by simultaneously increasing uh, energy efficiency and, and fire safety. Uh, the Green Deal is, is not just about energy used. Uh, of course, it is uh, uh, energy uh, produced. Is it renewable? And how can building stock also uh, do its sectoral specificities for the uh, uh, in uh, absorbing more renewables, uh, uh, namely in the warming, the houses and, and cooling in some cases, whereas the warming is the bigger part. But it is uh, not even only about energy sector at all, it is also about the materials used for the buildings and used for the renovations and actually also later in, in the uh, furniture and so on. But then we are uh, know that the building materials have their own uh, carbon footprint, what also needs to be taken on board when evaluating the big picture. So the materials include nowadays more advanced uh, knowledge on the fire safety uh, when uh, adopting different kinds of materials, which is very core for uh, the fire safety when it occurs and, and how can we avoid uh, fires to be dangerous for habitants and, and for the building itself as, as well. Uh, of course, the, when looking at the carbon footprint as, as such, uh, the wooden buildings uh, tend to be uh, more climate friendly. And then we have to really be uh, cautious on the design phase to make it at the same time a fire safe. The shirts on the renovation also aims to tackle worst performing buildings and the energy poverty. By improving the uh, energy efficiency of the buildings, we can reduce the energy bills and improve people's home by making them healthier and more, more comfortable. Energy poverty is a big and urgent issue in EU. 34 million Europeans are unable to afford keeping their home, home adequate warm. Too low temperatures cause uncomfortable conditions for the residents and what is more severe plays in risk their uh, health and even lives. Energy poverty is also linked to the safety po poverty. Statistics show that people suffering from safety po poverty are the same segments affected by energy poverty. Low income households are running increased risk of facing a double poverty. Focusing their resources on covering basic needs, they are more likely to rent cheaper, older housing, inappropriately maintained where adequate heating is difficult and electrical installations are obsolete. So affordable and social housing, for example, are often multi-story and multi-dwelling buildings and can be more vulnerable to risks such as fire. This is an important issue to address also during the renovation strategies, especially uh, as in this type of high-rise, high-density, high-risk buildings. Safe evacuation and firefighting may be more difficult. It then becomes crucial to limit fire spread and dangerousness of ensuring the level of fire safety matches the increases, uh, increased risks. It is crucial to be able to target and prioritize the most energy poor buildings in order to decrease energy and safety poverty. Also public buildings such as hospitals, schools, nurseries and so on should be in the top of the list 
when renovation strategies are planned. As we know, this is also what uh, is planned and what used to be that we set the targets for renovations on the public buildings, whereas I wish that we could uh, embed even stronger uh, targets all in all, uh, not depending who owns the building or is it used only for public or is it used in general for people even in the private uh, markets. Why it is so important to discuss about fire safety? Because we talk about the human life's uh, uh, safety and well-being. Every day in Europe, there are 5,000 fires in which 11 people average lose life and 190 are hospitalized. 1% of the European GDP is burned in fire costs yearly. This is why we need to pay special attention to the fire safety. The topic was also discussed in Parliament in many papers, uh, also the one mentioned in the beginning that a uh, Kufes report, I was happy to shadow the architect uh, Kufe from Ireland. Parliament stressed that the fire aspects should be considered during the design, selection of materials, construction, renovation and operation of buildings in order to improve prevention, detection, early suppression, evacuation, compartmentation, structural resistance and fire fighting, as well as the relevant competencies of professionals involved in different phases. Professional knowledge on this on design phase, construction phase and renovation phase. Also the revised energy performance buildings directive that I was happy drafting and negotiating last mandate noted the importance of fire safety by including two special articles uh, encouraging the EU member states to consider fire safety in buildings undergoing major, major renovation, as well as the long-term renovation strategies that now uh, the first uh, strategies uh, should have been proposed by each and one member states. So I, I hope this uh, consultation and, and talking with the uh, different stakeholders on fire safety is taking place in member states when planning long-term renovation strategies at the moment. Of course, when we were uh, in the fire uh, final places on negotiating this, the, the Grenfell Tower fire was so acute uh, and, and good memory. So we tried to uh, give our response for the uh, needs that what can be improved. Uh, so also uh, after this EPBD, we uh, had this uh, pilot project proposal by colleague, uh, the rapporteur Peng Peng Sen then, to have this uh, aim, uh, the um, funding for the fire statistics and pave the way for pan-European awareness campaign, as well as uh, better uh, materials uh, knowledge on the fire. So we need a holistic approach to fire safety uh, with uh, energy efficiency. Uh, this is very good time for this seminar to take place as we wait for uh, as a package of uh, Fit for 55 uh, strategy, we will uh, get a new review from the Commission proposal on energy efficiency directive, as well as a uh, uh, energy performance in the building directives as well uh, later. But then also we wait for the uh, construction products uh, materials uh, revision on the legislation, and then uh, countries are. Uh, do, using the recovery funds for the climate and then, of course, for the buildings. So renovation wave is an opportunity to cut the mission and improve the building stocks all and all to make greener houses, advanced wood buildings, improve energy efficiency and well-being and safety. New Bauhaus initiative will give positive boosts to all this to make uh, houses uh, sustainable, accessible and aesthetic. And I think your organization and knowledge here will have a say that no one of these initiatives will forget the fire safety. You are welcome and I am happy to give the floor back to the uh, Brussels. Thank you very much, and I think Kupul and Natri for this really comprehensive introduction and for highlighting some key policy or key initiative at the at the EU level, in particular developing on the INI report you worked with with MEP Kerf and other MEPs, as well as the inclusion of some fire safety uh, amendment in the EPBG revision. Uh, so thank you very much uh, for your time, uh, and we do appreciate your contribution. So now I will. Um, 
introduce our next speaker and we will uh, keep the focus at EU level with Mr. Goldstein. He will present on EU policy uh, focusing on energy efficiency and the opportunities they present for fire safety. So Mr. Goldstein is a member of the cabinet of Commissioner for Energy, Mrs. Kadri Simpson. He's in charge of energy and use, which involves energy efficiency, but also energy storage. And in the past, he has worked uh, for DG Ener as well as for national administration. So I see you're here and your presentation is ready to go. So now I leave the floor to you, Mr. Goldstein. Thank you very much, Jeremy. Uh, thanks very much for this wonderful opportunity to, to speak. Uh, Mia Petra for organizing this event and uh, over 140 participants this morning. Uh, I see time has been flying, so I'm happy to limit myself to about 10 minutes uh, for the presentation today. Uh, so uh, maybe to start off, uh, what is the European Green uh, Deal about? Uh, now, this is a concept that we came up with before the pandemic, and it was supposed to be the European growth strategy, as you see. Uh, it's not a traditional green uh, strategy or piece of legislation. You see economy aspects, uh, agricultural aspects. Um, you have, uh, of course, climate, but also energy being brought together even closer than before and the financing dimension. So it's not the type of uh, environmental piece of uh, forward thinking that we are usually used to having. Uh, and then COVID happened. Um, one would guess that, okay, I mean, first things come first. So uh, the green aspect might have a fold uh, to the background, but it's quite the contrary. Thanks to the growth element at its core, the European Green Deal has uh, remained uh, quite important and even grown. Um, Mia Petra already mentioned the Recovery and Resilience uh, Fund. Member states are relying heavily uh, in those uh, on buildings. And why is that? Let's give a little bit of background. Uh, Mia Petra already uh, mentioned the energy and greenhouse gas aspects, also the uh, urgency to renovate but to recall the figures, um, most of the buildings uh, that we see around us when we walk on the streets were built before any type of energy uh, requirements came into building codes. Same is true for fire standards. Uh, they have been evolving over time and they're different across different building types. Um, and that's why building renovation through renovation wave offers a big opportunity to upgrade uh, these standards, both fire safety, but also let's not forget about indoor air quality, access to buildings, and also the energy component, greenhouse gas component. So at the current rate of uh, new builds and uh, old buildings being taken down, we see that around 90% of the buildings will still be around by the time that we're supposed to decarbonize our economy. So just focusing on new builds is not going to help us. Uh, we're looking very closely, and I know that the parliament is as well um, knowledgeable about the dangerous substances in old buildings. So asbestos is one that comes to my mind in relation to fire safety. Uh, and this is indeed an avenue we need to uh, be quite careful about in the future when we roll out uh, uh, large scale renovations. So in terms of investment needs, about 100 billion euros is being invested today into building renovation, but there's still about 275 billion missing. So this is the additional annual investment that would uh, be needed in order to make buildings uh, fit for 55 and beyond. So today we already have an established framework. This means that we uh, have the, the recent uh, Clean Energy for All Europeans package, 
um, a lot of uh, market signals uh, available there. Now, maybe mentioning uh, fire safety standards, they mainly are uh, local and national uh, in their uh, nature. But this doesn't mean that we shouldn't uh, take them into account when we are renovating. We have certain, say, constraints in addressing these issues at an European level. Uh, due to the subsidiarity principle, uh, but uh, the fact that we are renovating already opens the door for the discussion to happen. That's first. And secondly, um, with the green transition getting closer to the ground, closer to the individual, we see that the relevance of the transition really depends on what type of ecosystem is set uh, on the municipal level, on the regional level. So fire safety actually becomes an essential part, an essential local ecosystem component to building renovation. Not necessarily one that European Union could regulate directly, but one that will need to be considered when carrying out renovations. So um, the impact today is not enough to achieve the targets and that links uh, to the finance gap. We have the recovery and resilience funds and the big part of the MFF supporting, but this is a fraction of what is needed. A lot of local funds, meaning private and public, will need to go into renovation. Um, People like improving their uh, living uh, environment. So 11% of the building stock undergoes some level of renovation each year, but that's um, from painting your facade to redoing your kitchen. That doesn't necessarily improve the fire safety levels or your energy performance. So this year we're going to look at the uh, uh, Fit for 55, a package uh, legislation, set of directives, energy efficiency directive, renewable energy directive, and the performance for buildings directive, um, among others, to set standards. And Mia Petra mentioned the requirements for energy performance in public buildings. These are currently limited only to the central government, which is about 3% of all buildings in inhabited or owned by the central government. That's not a lot. And uh, we're looking to broaden that scope for the next year. In order to respect the time, um, this is my last slide. What I want to say is that uh, last year was the year of strategies. It did build on a successful cooperation between the different institutions. But actually this year we'll be proposing and throughout the coming year or two we'll be negotiating the pieces of legislation that will bring change to the building ecosystem. So together, mainly the Parliament, Council of Ministers and European Commission working, we hope to um, bring new quality. And as uh, Mia Petrover nicely put it, it's a win-win-win. And I believe that it uh, can be not just the renovation wave, but also the European Green Deal in the context of recovery that still maintains that prominence and importance in uh, bringing growth back to, to the European continent. So I'd like to stop here and hand it back over to you, Jeremy. Thank you. Thank you very much, Carlis, and thank you very much for highlighting the fact that the renovation wave is an opportunity to upgrade buildings, not only for energy, <clears throat> but also in terms of access and safety, including fire safety, as well as indoor quality. So that's a really important component, as well as the fact that the European Commission, indeed, there is this principle of subsidiarity with member states, but there are still a lot of uh, a lot happening in terms of EU policy at EU level that can influence positively what is happening in member states. So thank you for sharing that with us. 
So now our next speaker will bring us a bit closer and we will get to the national level with uh, Mrs. Irina Klischelendic. Uh, she will present on the Croatia renovation and how they conduct renovation at national level, in particular, how they uh, marry both energy efficiency as well as fire safety. So she's the head of the sector for energy efficiency in buildings at the Croatian Ministry for Construction and Physical Planning. So as such, she, she's in charge of a national strategy, the implementation of EU regulation, as well as a legislation regarding energy efficiency of buildings. She has a background in civil engineering, and she has been working on several EU projects, including Build Upon Two. So thank you, Irina, for being with us today. And uh, now I leave the floor to you. Thank you for the introduction and hello from Zagreb. Today, I'm going to share with you some of Croatian experience on energy renovation and fire safety. So uh, amendments to the energy performance building directive in 2018 introduces opportunity for linking energy renovation of buildings with the requirements of fire protection and seismic reinforcement of buildings on new level. Article two of revised DPBD says that each member state may use its long-term renovation strategy to address fire safety and risk related to intense seismic activity affecting energy efficiency renovations and the lifetime of the building. Article seven says, that member states shall encourage in relation to buildings undergoing major renovation, high efficiency alternative systems, insofar as this is technically, functionally, functionally and <clears throat> economically visible, sorry, and shall address the issue of healthy indoor climate conditions, fire safety, and risks related to intense seismic activity. So in Croatia, we have to spell these articles in Building Act, in technical regulation on the rational use of energy in thermal insulation, and in the long-term innovation strategy of the national building stock by 2015. Building Act prescribes essential requirements for the buildings in the event of fire. And Building Act also prescribes that the long-term strategy contains an analysis of policies and measures that contribute to increasing fire protection and protection against earthquake-related risks and provide recommendations for improving health indoor climate conditions, fire protection, and risks for buildings undergoing significant renovation. Then technical regulation prescribes that major renovation requires an analysis of existing state of the building and the overview of measures to improve that existing state of the entire building, which with an investment assessment of health indoor climate conditions, fire protection, and risk associated with earthquake. A long term innovation strategy of the national building stock by 2050 was adopted by the Croatian government on uh, 14 December of the last year. It is aimed to transform the existing building stock into a highly efficient and decarbonized building stock by 2015. Uh, LTIRS defines comprehensive renovation like combination of optimal measures for improving the current condition of buildings and measures aimed at enhancing fire protection ensuring health indoor environment, enhancing mechanical resistance and building stability, especially for the purpose of reducing seismic risks. In addition to the above in Croatia, there are several other laws, technical regulations, standards and rules of technical practice, referring to fire safety, which designers should take into account, both in the case of construction of a new building and when the existing one is renovated. So I'm going to show just the amount of this regulation. So there are technical regulations, some more technical regulations, standards and technical practice. In previous period, 
We have implemented several national renovation programs, two programs for uh, public buildings, one for single family houses, one for multi apartment buildings. Uh, we have a very successful ESCO model. Uh, 69 public buildings were renovated using energy performance contract, including several hospital complex. A deep renovation concept was implemented in these projects, and with the modernization of technical systems and the installation of the renewables, renovation of the building envelope was mandatory in these projects. Due to fire regulation and raised awareness, non-combustible insulation was used in all of these projects. We also used new funds for regeneration of buildings. 577 public buildings and 539 multi apartment buildings have been renovated with total investment value of 526 million euros. Basic eligible criteria for energy renovation was 50% of savings in heating energy. <clears throat> we used our national eco fund to encourage the innovation of family homes and have used 100. 70 million euros for grants on 18,000 contracted projects in single family houses. Now we are drafting new set of national renovation programs for the next period from 2021 to 2030. So you can see new program for energy renovation, multi apartment buildings, new one for public sector buildings, new program for uh, energy renovation of cultural heritage buildings, program for fighting energy poverty, and so on. All of these programs promote deep and comprehensive building renovation, and special attention will be paid to the healthy indoor environment, fire protection, and measure for seismic reinforcement of buildings. Uh, Person to the amendments of the technical regulation on rational energy use, major renovation of buildings must be proceed by a building condition assessment, as well as a summary of measures to improve building condition, including investment assessment in regards to health indoor climate, fire protection, and seismic reinforcement. Uh, this building condition assessment is mandatory for all buildings that are going under major renovation. This, is, this assessment is an information and motivation to the investor on additional measures like fire safety or seismic reinforcement, which can be included during energy renovation. Of course, designers have to design according to the law and the technical re regulations I have mentioned before, but these regulations only provide basic requirements for buildings. And this assessment is a step toward holistic approach and comprehensive renovation, which will include optimal mix of measures for every single building. Uh, assessment of necessary investments showed the price of 330 euros per square meter for residential uh, buildings for uh, energy renovation, 460 euros for non-residential and up to 920 euros for already earthquake damaged buildings. But these prices are 2020 and they are rather low, they're going to rise. Uh, the current rate, of energy renovation with Croatia is 0.7% or 1.35 million square meters per year. Plan is to gradually increase to 30%, to 3%, sorry, by 2030, which is in line with the renovation wave initiative. And after that, we want to increase it even more to 3.5 from 2040 and to 4% to 2050. Uh, to transform the entire existing building stock into an, one which is energy efficient by 2050, we have set a milestones for 2030, 2040 and 2050. As you see, goal is to renovate about 31 million square meters of buildings by 2030, another 41 million by 2040, and 32 million square meters by 2050. 
This is estimation of required investment for the next three decades. Total investment cost of renovation for 2050 is about 243 billion kunas or 32 billion euros. And I have to say this estimation was done before earthquake in December. So uh, it's rather low. In order to ensure high quality of long-term renovation strategy, the Ministry of uh, Construction have organized five stakeholder dialogues with industry representatives, local national authorities, NGOs, companies, academic community, and independent experts. And conclusions from all five events have been part of LTRS document. First open stakeholder dialogue was held in December of 2018. And among other topics, fire safety was identified as an important area for renovation. The third open partner dialogue was held in April of 2019 and had the theme, application of modern solutions and implementation of rules on fire protection, increased seismic activity risk protection during energy renovation of buildings. And conclusions from this event were including a long-term renovation strategy as well. So thank you very much. Thank you, Irina, for this presentation and for sharing with us uh, the long-term renovation strategy of Croatia and how uh, fire safety and seismic also uh, components have been uh, included and giving us an overview of the legislative landscape and how you, you marry both energy efficiency uh, and safety in terms of fire and uh, seismic activity. So thank you very much. Um, now, if you can stop sharing your, your screen, uh, we will uh, move a bit closer to us to the local level now with uh, the presentation of Dr. Richardson um, with the project Build Upon Square. So Dr. Richardson is the director of the Europe Regional Network as a World Green Building Council, which coordinates over 20 green building councils and uh, eight um, regional partners. He will present to us today the Horizon 2020 uh, funded project, which is called Build, Build Upon Square. So this project uh, allows cities in eight European countries to test a renovation impact framework uh, and which support the commission renovation wave and which allows the city to make their building stock more resilient. So Dr. Richardson, the floor is yours. Thank you very much. I mean, good morning, everybody, or good afternoon, I should say, everybody. It's a great pleasure to be here this morning and uh, uh, this afternoon and to be presenting about uh, build upon project in the context of this discussion, um, uh, a really important discussion about uh, the renovation, um, the, the impacts of renovation and how we can use that to tackle some of the challenges that, uh, that our, our continent, our society is facing. So we've heard already this morning um, from some of the other speakers uh, about the, the scale of the challenge. So I won't, I won't to recap that too much, but I was struck recently by um, uh, a statistic that somebody uh, shared with me um, in, in relation to you know, the, the, the scale of, of what we need to achieve here uh, in terms of renovation. We've, we've seen the ambition uh, that uh, Irena shared from, from Croatia, the, the ambition to move from uh, around 1% to 3%, which is broadly reflected across the continent. That's the, the the level of uh, the level of change that we need to see. But what, what's really important to, to note is that on average, when you know where energy efficiency is being tackled in renovations, um, it's it's typically you know on a, on average across the continent, uh, renovations are only achieving around nine percent improvements in energy performance, which is nowhere near where it needs to be. We need, we need renovations on average to be achieving 55 to 65%. So really, really deep renovations being achieved across the board if we're to stand any chance of achieving the goals of the EU Green Deal, the Paris Agreement. And, and the sad thing is that we are still, in many countries in Europe, still building buildings that are going to need renovation over the coming years to meet that standard. Um, we, we really are 
create even now are creating more problems for ourselves in the future. So there's a really long way to go on this topic. But there is obviously reason to be optimistic. The EU has announced this, this exciting renovation wave program. Um, it's, it's, a, it's, it's a great initiative. And obviously as, as green building councils have been working on this topic uh, for many years now, we're very supportive of, of the ambition of the renovation wave and, and uh, you know, our, our, our whole network of councils across Europe stands ready to, to, to support implementing the wave. And we've heard already uh, about the Build Upon Squared project. Um, uh, it, Irina is, is on, on our advisory board, which is wonderful. We're, we're um, a, a program that is funded by the European Union through the Horizon 2020 uh, funding program it brings together uh, eight green building councils together with uh, the Building Performance Institute Europe and Climate Alliance representing the Covenant of Mayors and the project at its heart is, um, is really bringing cities into the picture. So um, we have looked over the years at uh, examples of renovation practice, we've looked at policy at the national level we work very, very um, actively on uh, in the first phase of the program on national renovation strategies, and and in the second phase, which is is the phase that I'm talking about today, we we are taking that forward to really bring the cities into the picture. And the reason we we feel that's so important is that as we've looked at examples of best practice across Europe, as we've um, you know, we've convened many thousands of people. The, the first phase of, of the Build Upon project was described as the world's largest collaborative project on renovation. It brought together literally thousands of stakeholders across Europe um, to co-create uh, better national renovation strategies. Some of the lessons that we've learned through that are that, you know, um, it, it really is at the city level that, that renovation happens. That's where, where, where the rubber hits the road, as we would say. In English and um, I, I want to share a few of the lessons from from this second phase of the project with you today so we we brought out a report uh, last year where we, um, we we looked at what what it, what will it take to to achieve the renovation wave what what are the what are the key ingredients that are needed to make the renovation wave a success and we've uh, from from all of the hundreds of initiatives that we've we've reviewed over the, the course of, of build upon um, we've we've boiled it down to to uh, four key pillars that we feel need to be at the heart of, of, of what you know of the renovation wave initiative firstly the wave needs to be local I've, I've pointed to the importance of cities um, that is where renovation happens it doesn't happen at national level it is local actors uh, local stakeholders that, that deliver renovation initiatives so it needs to focus on that local level it's crucial that, that the wave convenes different stakeholders, and that's a, a point that I'm going to emphasize a lot in my presentation today. Um, we really believe that renovation to be successful needs to bring together the unusual suspects. We need, um, we, we really need to convene across the whole value chain to make a success. Um, I pointed here to the importance of, of regulation in the report, we, we, we highlight how you know that there's only so far that you can go with with voluntary schemes with with sort of pilot programs if we want to achieve the scale that we've you know we've seen already in the present previous presentations is needed it's, it's critical that, 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 that we bring re regulation in that will drive that forward otherwise the pace just won't won't uh, be reached and the final point which again is a point i'm going to emphasize here is that um, and, a, and a point that really goes to the heart of what we're trying to do with Build Upon Squared is that the renovation wave, it needs to be guided by good data. Um, that the, those four points are really critical. So Build Upon, as, as I've said, is, is tackling these issues head on. Um, I, I've mentioned what, you know, we're working with eight green, green building councils. Each of those councils is working with a pilot city to develop and test an impact framework uh, that, that is a framework of metrics and indicators that is designed to capture data on the, the, the benefits, the impact that renovation initiatives are having at the local level. And what that does is it means it, we're, we're enabled 
and the cities are enabled to identify best practices, you know, what is really working um, and what's not. Because until we have that data, until we can see what, you know, where, where impact is being achieved, we're, we're really flying blind. We, we're, you know, we're trying to scale things that we don't even know whether they're working or not. And so the, the framework is, um, is, is, is both a tool and a guide for these cities. So within the framework, uh, we, we have uh, identified a series of, of metrics and indicators that, that the cities will track as they go, uh, you know, as, as projects are being, uh, are being implemented, whether that's projects where the city is directly involved or whether it's you know, privately uh, uh, initiated projects, the city has the ability to use this framework to track those benefits working collaboratively with the stakeholders involved. And the, the, um, what's, what's key here is that the metrics are not just on environmental issues. And, and I was really pleased to hear um, uh, uh, Carly Goldstein emphasize the point about that, you know, the, these looking at these holistic benefits, um, that our, our framework looks at environmental, social and economic categories with multiple indicators across each of those categories. And so the, the, the framework points the cities to, to you know, what are the metrics that, that they should be tracking and also helps them to identify how they can track that, where they can find the data. And, and what, that, um, what that helps them to do is, is to strengthen the case for renovation. So um, the, the, both the business case and the political case. Uh, having a clearer idea, a clearer data on you know, what are the benefits that renovation achieves helps, uh, as I say, to strengthen the economic argument. So when, you know, when uh, investors are building business cases, it, it, it strengthens that argument, but it's also really key for, for the policy argument. Um, we, we need much more political backing behind renovation. It needs to become a really, really key political priority. And, and it's great to see that there is movement on that already, but we believe that the, the Build Upon Squared framework can help drive that agenda forward because when, when, when cities are able and municipalities, you know, this isn't just for, just for cities, it applies in, in, in much smaller municipalities as well. When they're able to demonstrate how the renovation initiatives that they're running that are happening on the ground in their, in their uh, uh, locality, are contributing not just to not just to energy and carbon reduction, but also to you know these wider uh, wider social and environmental and economic issues, whether it's employment, whether it's we've heard already about health, um, you know whether it's uh, related to resilience of the built environment, which I'll come on to in a moment. Um, that really strengthens the the case and and the the, the advocacy case for um, making this a political priority. So I want to just uh, touch on a couple of case studies from cities that we are working with, um, case studies that we've looked at where, uh, you know, where we see this being put into practice and where that, that holistic data-driven approach is having real impact. So firstly, uh, 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 an initiative from Dublin, um, a, a scheme that's being run where renovations are being paired. So, so renovations that address energy, and energy poverty are being linked up with um, improvements in, in indoor air quality and, and being targeted at the most vulnerable. So those who, who are um, suffering from respiratory conditions, um, the city is investing a significant amount in improving the quality of those homes and, and therefore you know, thereby reducing the issues that exacerbate the respiratory conditions that those people are suffering from. And, and the, the data that the program is, is, is generating is demonstrating how the, the interventions are having a, a dramatic improvement on the health of, of the building occupants, as well as achieving CO2 emissions reductions um, across all the properties uh, engaged. Second case study here, um, we're, we're working with the city of, of Parava in Italy. Um, Part of a ha, has the, the municipality has recognised that their built environment uh, is is vulnerable to physical shocks, um, and these include uh, both the, the the current and the 
predicted future increase in, in urban heat, uh, the urban heat island effect. So, um, you know, very high temperatures uh, causing buildings to become, you know, very uncomfortable, uh, heat stress, people, the occupants really suffering from that. So that's one risk. Also, seismic risk is, is another issue that, that Padova is grappling with. And so, again, they, they are using the, the, uh, the, the, the framework, adapting it to their own specific needs to look at these issues. So where, where renovations are happening, identifying key metrics that can be used to track progress against not just energy and carbon, but also against resilience to these physical threats. And so I'll, I'll just um, kind of conclude with a, a, what I feel is one of the most important points to, to emphasize from, from what we've learned through this program. Um, and, and that is that renovation is, is a systemic challenge. There are systemic barriers that are holding back our progress. They, were, they will hold back the, the, the success of the renovation wave unless we take a systemic approach. But what that also means is that on the flip side, renovation has, uh, can unlock systemic opportunities. And so we, we, if we want to succeed, we have to stop thinking about this in, in a two-dimensional way. Uh, it's not just about energy and carbon. Um, so what we, what we learn from the case studies and the cities that we're working with is that when, um, you know, when, we, when we design initiatives that don't just bring the engineers and the contractors together, but also involve you know, the, the doctors and the healthcare, social workers, uh, you know, seismologists and geologists, these, these different stakeholders, that's when we start to see the, you know, the, real, the real impact and the real benefits being unlocked and we'll start to see real breakthrough. Um, and, and in terms of next steps, the, the, the program is running towards the end, so we'll conclude at the end of this year, we'll be launching the final version of this impact framework in Q2. We're recruiting a, a cohort of what we're calling follower cities who will work with the pilot cities and learn from their experiences and, and roll the framework out more widely. I mentioned that we're partnering with the Covenant of Mayors through Climate Alliance. So we're, we're, we're working with them to look at incorporating these metrics, this framework into uh, the, the CCAPs, which many, many cities have developed as, as part of their, their commitment to, the, the, to becoming Covenant signatories. And we're also looking you know, at the feedback from the cities, how, how can we adjust these and adapt these framework indicators to take account of these different issues uh, that, are, you know, that, that cities face. Uh, and so you know, interested to explore with, with the other panelists and, and through the questions and discussion, how, you know, how um, the framework could contribute to uh, also tackling or, or supporting a, 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 you know, a, a, an informed and holistic approach to, to fire safety, which is, is clearly absolutely critical for our built environment as well. So thank you for your attention. I look forward to the discussion. Thank you very much, uh, Stephen, for, for this presentation and for uh, highlighting the importance of data when conducting a renovation and the importance of conducting deep renovation and as well as sharing the lessons you learned. So the fact that it has Renovation has to be guided by uh, regulation, by da data driven by regulation, and that it is very much local and needs to be uh, involving all meaningful uh, stakeholders. So thank you for the presentation. Uh, now we will uh, continue with uh, Dr. Amaya Ozakar. So she is the chair of the advisory panel on building sustainability of the European fire safety community. And she will present today on the importance of conducting uh, renovation that are both energy efficient and fire safe and the benefits to get from that. Um, she has a background and a PhD in building engineering and she has specialized in uh, building fire safety. She also has an extensive uh, expertise when it comes to the dynamics between sustainability and building fire safety. So Amaya, now the floor is yours. Uh Thank you very much for this nice presentation. Um, I'm sorry. And thank you also for, for the invitation. Okay, it's a pleasure for me to be to be here with you. So I 
I firmly believe that, that uh, as a mature society, we need to advance building upon the knowledge that we've gathered through the years. And so ignoring the lessons learned and not making the most of these lessons is not a choice. So that's why in my view, it is not acceptable for us not to integrate the five safety learnings in the sustainability understanding that we are developing together. So to explain a bit better this, this idea, I will provide some basic historical background. We will review what's a sustainable building and I will develop a bit further on the importance of the fire safety for a sustainable building environment. So to finish with, I will propose some concrete ideas for us to, to move forward. So we, we all know it was mentioned already before that fire codes has been developed and revised based on what we've learned through the years. So if we look at history, we see that catastrophic events with a lot of people casualties, property losses and business interruptions uh, have been through the years. So from this adverse event, we learn and implement better practices to deliver safer buildings through better codes. So I've selected some examples okay, of big fire and the regulatory responses to illustrate this, this idea. So the first one, it's the Great Fire of Rome, which began in the 64 before Christ. So the fire expanded through an area of narrow streets. Okay, it began in a shop and it really destroyed four of the Rome 14 district at that time. Okay, sorry, it only four of these 14 district at that time escaped the fire. So it destroyed 10 of the district. So for the city reconstruction, new building rules were put in place and that there were, there were ensuring the free space between the buildings to ensure that the fire spread was limited. Okay, so the second event that I selected was the fi big fire of London, okay, that started in a bakery on the 2nd of September, 60, uh, 1666. So the fire spread very rapidly through the densely built timber housing of the city and was out of control for two days. So it destroyed the medieval city of London inside the old Roman wall, okay? So it is estimated to have destroyed the homes of 70,000 people. The social and economic problems created by the disaster were overwhelming and the building rules developed in the aftermath of the fire are believed to be the origin of the modern regulation and fire insurance industry. In third place, I selected the Great Baltimore Fire, which started in a building in Maryland in 1904 and spread very quickly due to insufficient resources for fire fighting. Okay, so the property lost from the disaster was estimated in $100 million. And as a result of the fire, Baltimore developed the and implemented the first formal building code in US. So the Grenfell Tower fire that we all remember, okay, caused 72 deaths. A total of 151 homes were destroyed in the tower and surrounding area. And the fire severely affected three low rise blocks adjoining the, the tower. So today, we are still experiencing the social, economic, and environmental consequences of that fire. So we can see that catastrophic fire events are constant along the history, and the fire hazard is inherent to all buildings. Okay, today, even in Europe, there are 5,000 fires causing the death of 11 people every day, and 1% of the GDP is dedicated to fire costs every, every year. So, but we know, okay, that the European Union has an important role to play. And among the shared competences of the European Union, is to support and to complement the actions of the member states for fire risk prevention, excluding, of course, any harmonization of their laws or regulation. 
but also the European Parliament and Council shall establish the necessary measures to help the countries to address the common fire safety concerns. So today in Europe, okay, the fire safety is a minimum requirement for all the buildings of the, Euro of the member countries. And the countries address buildings fire safety in their national building regulation, okay. But also following Grenfell disaster, the TG Grow created the fire exchange platform to stimulate the cooperation between the member states, as well as to allow the exchange of best practices and lessons between them and relevant stakeholders in the field of fire safety. So up to now, okay, in the presentation, we've seen that fire safety has been a social concern throughout the history. And we know that fire risk is real and traceable along the years. So our society has an important register of catastrophic events, uh, fire events, sorry, justifying the management of fire risk as part of the risk prevention policies. But, okay, differently from the fire safety, it has taken us more time to understand that our natural environment is in crisis. Okay, and there is no an easy and isolated, isolated solution to this global challenge. And to tackle the drama, a global shift towards a sustainable development is, is needed. Okay, so we could say that the social awareness was burned and evolved in the last 75 years. So to help visualize this idea, Okay, I pointed out the formation of the Uni United Nations and some of their action in regard to sustainability aspects. So like Wisefire, this milestone highlighted in the presentation, so the, the Earth Summit of Rio de Janeiro, the Kyoto Protocol, or the adoption of the Paris Climate Agreement have followed the repetition of catastrophic events that made us think that something was going wrong. So, our understanding of the impact on our action in our natural environment has massively evolved in the last year, and sustainability is a major item in the social agenda globally. But as I mentioned earlier in the presentation, so as a mature society, we need to build upon the knowledge that we've acquired through the years, meaning that it is important to understand and recognize the impact of fires in the natural environment and in our sustainability goals. So we know that uh, sustainable development meets the needs of the present without compromising the ability of the future generation to meet their own needs. Okay, but to fully understand sustainability, we need a, a system thinking. Okay, so we need to look at the three pillars of the sustainability, the environmental pillar, the social pillar, and the economic pillar. So if any one pillar is weak, then the system as a whole is unsustainable. So the European Great Deal, as we've seen okay, before, is our plan to make the economy of the European Union sustainable. And Europe is decided to be the first climate neutral continent for 2015. Okay. And buildings play a very important role in this plan, okay, because they are responsible for about 40% of the total energy consumption and 36% of the greenhouse gas emissions in Europe. But we know that building codes with a specific uh, regulation on thermal insulation for the building envelope started in the 1970s in Europe, okay? And more than one third of the building stock today is over 50 years old, okay? Sorry about that. And um, yeah, 40% of the, okay, yeah. 40% of this stock of buildings, okay? it was built before 1960, okay? So now almost 75 of the buildings that we have, okay, are energy inefficient according to current building standards. So yes, the energy performance of building is an area where effort must be ramped up. And the renovation wave strategy of the European Commission is intended to double 
the renovation rate to improve the energy performance of buildings. So we know that building renovation can reduce the energy bills and cut down emissions, but building renovation can also generate other social, environmental, and economic benefits. With the same intervention, okay, buildings can be made healthier, greener, more accessible, resilient to extreme natural events, and of course, fire safe. So what's happening today? So we see okay, that current efforts to improve the sustainability of buildings, focusing on increasing energy efficiency and reducing the embodied carbon, overlooks the fact that a fire event could reduce the overall sustainability of a building. So energy efficient buildings may be sustainable or not. So yeah, a green building is not necessarily a sustainable building. So the introduction of new material systems and features for which fire safety performance may not be well understood, may not be well understood, sorry. So it's an opportunity to enhance the energy performance of buildings. However, it also has the potential for fire hazard or for fire risk. So it is very important to ensure that sustainable, sorry, suitable schemes to assess the fire risk of these technologies are in place. So there are many green building features and products that individually or together may have a negative impact on fire safety unless there is a design approach which mitigates those, those effects. So there are already specific studies that highlight the fire challenges of green buildings, but a permanent assessment of the risk of new development is crucial right now. So we've seen that sustainable buildings are something else than green buildings or energy efficient buildings. So sustainable buildings are buildings that are designed, constructed, used and deconstructed, okay, in a way that have the minimum negative impact or even a positive impact on the environment, the occupants and the economy. So we need to look at each of these three pillars to understand what's the impact of a building fire on the sustainability, okay? So if we focus on the environmental pillar, we see that building fires can negatively affect the, the air, the soil and the water, but not only from the fire itself, but also from the fire extinguishing agents and the remains of the fire that easily contaminate the environment. So the overall emissions okay, from typical building fires in Sweden in the 1990s was of the same order of magnitude of emissions from the heavy goods vehicle transport during the same period of time. Okay. The social impact of a building fire not only refers to the casualties or to the number of people injured, but also to the disruption of public services or loss of jobs. For example, only in UK, it is estimated that the education of 90,000 uh, children is disrupted each year due to these fires. And if we look at the economic pillar, so the impacts refer to direct and indirect costs on local communities for reconstruction or demolition of damaged building and infrastructure financial losses for citizens and businesses, and also for decontamination costs. So yeah, I mentioned before, I think that the total economic loss of fires is 1% of the GDP in most advanced countries. And just in US, okay, the total cost of fire in 2014 was of $328.5 billion. So I would like to finish my presentation with this message, okay? So as part of the learning process, we have understood that buildings fire safety is an essential factor of sustainable buildings, but therefore energy efficient buildings have to address fire safety. And the renovation wave is a great opportunity to improve the fire safety of existing buildings. 
So we are in a point of the journey where it is very urgent to integrate the fire risk understanding that we are, sorry, it is very urgent to integrate the fire risk understanding that we have, okay, into the specific policy development of the European Green Deal to build a sustainable future. So given the shared competencies of the union, we believe that it has an important role to play here. And in particular, okay, in helping the countries to raise awareness of the link between the measures to improve buildings energy efficiency and the fire risk, okay. Also, okay, to ensure consistency between the national regulatory developments for building re renovation, energy efficiency, and fire safety, okay, and also to develop specific tools to systematically address the fire safety of new and renovated energy efficient buildings. And this is everything from my side. So thank you very much. Thank you, Amaya, uh, for, for this presentation uh, and for highlighting the, the great potential of uh, technology solution like green solution in terms of energy efficiency, sustainable development, but also the fact that we still need to account for uh, the changing fire risk uh, when we, we renovate a building to increase energy efficiency and uh, pay specific attention to the resulting fire performance of the building. So thank you for for your presentation. Uh, now we will start the Q&A session. Um, so I will, here we go. Okay, so we, we received a few questions. If you have not yet typed your questions, please send them through the Q&A box and we will have the speakers uh, address them. Can I please ask uh, all our panelists to put back on their cameras and to think about unmuting yourself when you answer a question. So we had a first question, and I think this one could be first taken by uh, Dr. Ozakar, and then if she, if other panelists want to address it, uh, it's a question from Anno Werning, uh, mentioning the fact that each presentation mentioned the co-benefits of renovation, in particular fire safety of the renovated building. But when do you think uh, this aim is achieved in terms of fire safety? Is a building fire safe only when you have non-combustible materials? Or what is your definition? I think it's more in terms of uh, thinking of a system of a building. But Amaya, if you want first to start. I think that in my view, this is a question that cannot be solved by us. This is a question that needs to be specified at country level. Okay, so each country level need to ensure that the buildings have the minimal level of fire safety according to their criteria according to their sensibilities, according to the type of building, to the type of fire that they have. So this is no, there is not a common response for, for everything, for everyone, sorry. This is definitely a question that needs to be response at the national level. But, but what is true is that the a minimal level of fire safety that makes sense for each country needs to be granted. Thank you, Amaya. If uh, I don't know if Irina, maybe you want to to answer on this one, since you're representing a EU member state, or uh... well, you have uh, fire safety measures in every part of buildings. So you have responsible designers for envelope of the buildings, and the other for the technical systems. You have measure uh, fire safety measures in heating systems, in cooling systems. So uh, you have to implement it every part or in every part of the project and in every part of the constructing or renovating of the building this is comprehensive work yeah thank you thank you for your answers uh i will move on to to the next question so it's a question from uh, lydia kostova uh, I hope I, I pronounce the names uh, well, sorry if I'm mistaken. So um, she said that green fire safety for public building is in line with the European construction product regulation. And she's asking what about a European construction products regulation in the renovated projects of residential buildings and private households? So I don't know if... Uh, Colleagues or Amaya, maybe, or I don't know, whoever is feeling competent on that topic can take the floor. I don't know. Could you please repeat your question? Yeah, sure. I would really appreciate. Yeah. 
So uh, green fire safety for public building is in line with the CPR. So basically the construction product regulation. Uh, what, what about maybe considering a European construction product regulation in the renovation projects uh, of residential buildings and private households? I, I think that, I don't know, in my view, I think the construction product regulation is a piece of regulation that we need to apply and to implement in parallel to other policy development and regulatory development. So the CPR to establish or deliver the common rules for us to, to, to sell, to buy products, to ensure a, a common say, quality and a common language in different countries. So I think that Mm, I would say that we need to defend, I would say, the, the requirements of the CPR, okay, for bill, for products to deliver a certain quality, minimum quality buildings, okay, but this is something that comes, in my view, in parallel with the other pieces of, uh, with the, the directives and the local, uh, the national regulation developing this. This is, uh, this is my view on this. I'm not sure if I responded or, or not. Thank you. Carlis, do you want to, I see you speaking, but you're still muted. <laughs> I didn't want to jump in before you finished uh, handing over the floor. No, indeed. Uh, I think just to compliment, um, construction products are often sourced uh, locally, indeed. So it's a question not only about the requirements, but also how it's being enforced and implemented. Uh, what I mean by this is that, uh, of course, the commission is open to review, revise the construction products regulation. Uh, I think as Irina quite rightly pointed out, we'll have to see it in the context of the rest of the policy as well. And right now the question is, how can we uh, make the biggest qualitative change? So if the construction products regulation is a crucial element and the commission decides that its scope needs to be altered, then it will be uh, adjusted. And I think it's a very wise suggestion that you make here to consider it. Um, but at this stage, it's a bit early to say whether it will or will not be. I mean, it, we're, uh, right now at the point where we are um, working on the, the political uh, agreement to a wider renovation, I think the will is there. The question is, uh, once you get into the details, how to do it, which requirements should apply, how many uh, wider benefits renovation should address. And I think Stephen quite uh, interestingly pointed out to the different areas that building renovation uh, has to uh, tackle. So in that sense, um, there is, I think it's really easy to agree with somebody uh, on principles. We, we all agree that building renovation uh, needs a new, let's say, push. But once you get into the details, um, there's a lot of uh, individual preference um, and I wanted to thank uh, colleagues who took the floor before, um, including Amaya, for drawing attention to these different aspects. Thank you very much, colleagues, for complementing the, the previous uh, answers. So we have a follow-up question to the first question. So the first question was from Eno uh, Wining and um, was asking about what do we consider fire safe in terms of a fire safe building. The follow-up question is, uh, well, first she thanks the panelists or his, and uh, ask, do you see lacks of regulation in the member states? Um, and I think uh, Stephen can also answer later on on that one, maybe not in terms of member states, but maybe the, the feedback from local authorities in terms of uh, regulation, in terms of renovation and uh, fire safety. So I don't know if uh, maybe Irina, you, you want to go ahead? I, I think Raisha has quite a lot of regulation in terms of fire safety, but... Uh... Oh, like five slides with technical regulations on fire safety. 
So I don't see problem in regulation. Really. <laughs> Stephen, if you want to go forward in terms of uh, regulation of renovation, and I don't know if you can give the fire safety angle, but. Um, so I, I think in terms of renovation, I mean, what, what we've what we've said is clearly, you know, we believe we need stronger re regulation to drive up renovation rates. Um, we see that, you know, the rates are, despite all of our best efforts over the many years, um, rates aren't where we want them to be. So, you know, we believe that needs to be strengthened. On, on fire safety, I, I'm, I'm not a fire safety expert. I will hold my hands up to that. Um, so, I, you know, I, I certainly wouldn't be able to comment on, on the need for, um, for regulation. I think, you know, what, what's, um, if I can sort of speak from the, the perspective of, of the, the sort of sustainability perspective and, and, you know, maybe the audience can sort of judge for themselves whether that translates into, into the fire safety context. What, what I think is really key, you know, it is, is that we, we need much greater awareness of the issues. Um, you know, we, we, need, uh, we need that awareness to be, to be uh, sort of disseminated throughout the entire population because renovation, as I mentioned earlier, is such a systemic issue, you know, that the, the the decision to renovate, the you know the, the point at which somebody might renovate, the uh, the way that they do it, the way that they finance it, how they will get um, access to the, the various services that they need, all of that is highly complicated, um, and um, and so we you know we need we need awareness, you know across all of those different stakeholders involved about the issues that that you would want to tackle and that under sustainability and the the kind of the, the pros and cons of, of all the different options that are available and and so i think you know potentially that's that's uh, and 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 one of the one of the key ways to sort of address that is by um you know having easy access to to qualified professionals you know having expertise that people can 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 contact, they know where to go, they know who to speak to, and they know that they can trust that person's professional judgment. Um, you know, that, that's something that we've seen, you know, many of you will have heard of the, this concept of a one-stop shop idea, um, which is, you know, I think has been one of the more successful sort of models for driving forward renovation. And the, the strength of that is that it provides this easy access to, to qualified professional advice. And again, I think that you know there could be parallels there with you know with with the fire safety issue that we you know we we probably need better awareness and we probably need better access to to that that qualified professional advice. Um, but again, the caveated with you know that's a, a sustainability professional's perspective. Thank you for for your answer. I think yeah, indeed, it's important to to highlight that it's uh, I guess not only a matter of uh, legislation and implementation, even if we have to take that in consideration, but also a, a challenge regarding the building professional um, involved in the project because each professional has their specialty. Uh, and when it comes to fire safety, obviously uh, they ha has to be taken in consideration at different stages and involving the right professional or at least uh, continuing educating a, a, right, a wide array of professionals. So I don't know if, uh, well, indeed, maybe one-stop shop could be uh, one of the solution to try to uh, get all these uh, people together. Um, but do you have other ideas on how to maybe overcoming this challenge of, uh, let's say, a split expertise uh, in terms of uh, fire safety and the different professionals uh, involved uh, in a renovation project? I don't know who would like to take the floor on that. So I think it's time to switch to holistic approach, first from designing and then from building. And this is the way to move forward with that. So all kinds of engineers have to work together from the beginning if you're going to construct new buildings. So from the beginning of design, and this is the same in innovation, in innovation projects. Thank you, Irina. Uh, I think that can lead nicely to, to one question we got on, on data for uh, 
you and I can. Um, again, apologies if I'm uh, not pronouncing right the name. So uh, the question is, data is at the heart of the renovation, and that was highlighted by different uh, panelists today. Is EU planning to develop a geographical database that documents the ba basic material of building clusters and qualitatively uh, the existing states? So that would, sorry. Um, I, I, sorry, I missed the question. Okay, I, I will repeat. So data is at the heart of the renovation. Is the EU planning to develop a database that would uh, list uh, and document the basic materials of buildings as well as the existing state in terms of quality? Uh, and that would be constantly updated. So I think that might be one of the objective of the building renovation passport uh, coming up later on. But uh, Mr. Goldstein, if you want to go first, and then maybe other panelists can react. Thank you. Uh, in fact, there are two instruments that uh, relate to that uh, universe of concepts. One that you mentioned is the building renovation passport. So this is something basically as a, as a roadmap for a building uh, user or owner about um, the, the state of their building, what has been done, what could be done, um, possibly with the direct links to measures and so that they can apply really quickly and know where, where and how and when they should fund. The, the other thing that might be a little bit more pertinent uh, in this uh, situation is the digital building logbooks. And these are more like uh, depositories of data uh, about the quality of the building. Now for existing buildings, that's always a challenge because we don't necessarily know what went into the building in the first place. Although with certain levels of uh, uh, magnitude, we can uh, deduce that. When we construct or renovate, everything that is added on top in terms of material characteristics that then can go into that digital building logbook. So these are two concepts that should go hand in hand. I'm making a distinction just because the renovation waived it. Uh, but I mean, conceptually, this should be part of the same uh, data universe. And on top of that, overlaying this with the building uh, registries or building uh, data, knowing, for example, roof angles of uh, buildings uh, and other, let's say, locational data, usage data, energy use, that can give us uh, a certain prediction about how to design measures. So it ties back to some of the questions we've been discussing, how to involve people. Well, in order to involve people it's, uh, and stakeholders, it's often good to have a variety of data so that uh, they can take informed decisions based on them. Thank you. Thanks for, for this answer. I don't know if anyone else wants to, to add something. Yes, you, you will go for it. Yes, so regarding to thermal insulation, we have that data in our energy performance certificate database, where we keep all energy certificates and energy audits on buildings. So we can use it for this purpose too. Okay, yeah. Thank you. So another example at the state level also, not only the EU level. Um, okay, so I think due to time, we're going to have to close the, the Q&A. If any of you has one last word or something they would like to, to, to point to, uh, you, you can do so now. <laughs> No, I think that's fine. Okay, perfect. So uh, a few words to, to close this uh, roundtable today. So um, as Amin Pink Kupulanatri has said, the renovation wave can really be a win-win policy in terms of um, achieving all climate objectives, increasing the comfort of building as well as safety dimension being seismic safety, for instance, or fire safety. So it's an unprecedented amount of money that is being invested in the EU building stock today through the EU Green Deal and the renovation wave. And we really need to make the most out of it and make sure we can um, achieve all the co-benefits of renovation simultaneously because it's quite historic and I think it's a, a really a unique opportunity. So um, we know that buildings are complex system, but with all the, the expertise that there is out there, if we work well together, we can definitely use the right technology, right solution and right expertise to 
uh, harness all these co-benefits of renovation. So we need to, to succeed and do it all at once and do it well. And that's why at Fire Safety Europe, we insist on this simultaneous um, characteristic of renovation and, and the need to, to take a holistic approach. Um, as Amaya uh, Osaka uh, highlighted, fire is an old and well-known uh, threat to buildings, but also to, to society and the EU citizens in general. And we need really to pay a constant and renew attention to, to fire because the risk is ever-changing. Um, so the good news, as uh, Stephen Richardson showed, is that we have tools, we have impact frameworks to see uh, how renovation is impacting our building stock and how we can make our buildings more resilient. So we should definitely exploit that to, to the maximum and uh, include diverse factors like fire safety. So in recent years, we also have seen an increase in high-risk fires. Uh, Grenfell is a really tragic example, but that only shows that we cannot satisfy ourselves with a one-dimensional approach to building uh, performance. And we really need to have like a, a holistic approach for legislators and stakeholders at EU level, but also national and local level. Um, this renovation wave and all the revision of legislation coming up, such as the EPDD, the EED, the CPR, or the RED, uh, are really opportunities to include fire safety and, um, and make sure to have an integral uh, approach to building, fire, uh, building performance. So including fire safety uh, for us would be the best way to secure the investment, but also to increase the safety of occupants as well as their comfort and maximize this investment in renovation. One last point, uh, Mr. Goldstein and uh, Mrs. Chris Schellendich uh, highlighted the, the funds and, and the money invested in, in such renovation. And it's really important that we make it profitable for EU citizens. And the idea of conditionality explored uh, at crash at, in Croatia maybe is an idea that we could explore uh, in different member states or at, at the EU level. So um, making sure that the funds invested to energy efficient renovation or significant funds at least also require some kind of a, a minimal uh, performance or, or some requirements in terms of fire safety and other uh, kind of safety, like for instance, seismic safety. So uh, that's it uh, for today from our side. Uh, I would like to, to thank uh, again our host MEP Kupula Natri for being here and all our speakers for sharing uh, their expertise and for having this uh, really lively discussion with, with us. Uh, I hope the audience uh, like the, the debate. Um, I would also like to thank all the participants for contributing, for sending your question and for taking part in this much needed discussion. If you are interested in building sustainability, I invite you to join the EU fire safety community. We have an advisory panel there dedicated to uh, building sustainability and fire safety. So you could join at eufiresafety.community. The information has been passed in the chat box. So uh, once again, thank you to, to all the panelists for your contribution today and uh, we'll, we'll be in touch soon. Thanks to everyone. Bye. Thank you. Bye. 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 Thank you very much. Bye-bye. Thank you.